Coming up on DTNS, Amazon might buy a movie studio, why Apple thinks gaming is in fact different than Netflix, and all the announcements from Google I.O. from Android 12's new soft, bubbly look to the unification of Wear OS and Tizen. It happened. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, May 18th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us, CTO at Skidmore, Owings & Merrill, also venture partner at Spark Labs Global, Rob DeMillo. Welcome back. Hello. Thank you for having me back. Uh, we were just talking about how much school has changed since Rob and I were young. <laughs> uh, and also some of our impressions on Google I.O. and the, the presentation itself, uh, and, you know, Google's attitude towards it. If you want that wider conversation, uh, get Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Foxconn and the carmaker Stellantis signed a non-binding memorandum of understanding to form Mobile Drive, a joint venture to supply in-car and connected car technologies. Mobile Drive will supply infotainment, telematics, and cloud services software and hardware to Stellantis and other interested automakers. On Monday, a Palestinian user in the U.S. named Rami said that a $50 Venmo payment he received labeled Emergency Palestinian Relief Fund had been flagged as under review and unavailable available until it could be examined by Venmo's compliance team. Venmo then followed up asking the purpose of the transferred money. Rami told restofworld.org that he was collecting money from friends for the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund. Rest of World noted that transactions with keywords like Free Palestine, Free Palestinian, Palestinian Emergency, and Palestinian Fund all completed with no problems. A Venmo spokesperson said the issue was OFAC-related. The U.S. Department of Treasury's Office of Foreign Assets Control maintains a list of people and organizations impacted by U.S. sanctions. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman sources say that Apple will release a redesigned MacBook Pro as early as this summer in 14- and 16-inch models featuring an Apple Silicon system on a chip with eight high-performance cores and two efficiency cores in either 16 or 32 graphics core variations with support for up to 64 gigs of memory. Apple's also reportedly working on a new Mac Mini featuring the same chip and a Mac Pro desktop set for 2022 with a choice of 20 or 40 competing core variations with up to 128 graphic scores. The New York Times obtained documents that it says show Apple moved iCloud data of Chinese users, including their encryption keys, from servers outside China to a network of servers from state-owned operation GCBD. Apple denies the report, says it has control of the encryption keys. Apple says the documents are outdated, it uses the latest protections, and it keeps third parties disconnected from its networks. The Chinese government also made a statement that it, quote, strictly adheres to principles of data security protection and prohibits and cracks down on relevant illegal activities in accordance with the law. Logitech launched a $1,200 whiteboard camera called Scribe, which uses AI-enhanced software to make a presenter transparent so viewers of remote presentations can see the whiteboard. Scribe currently only supports Zoom Room, but support from Microsoft Teams will arrive later this year. Now, we have been talking earlier this week about how sometime mid-next year, uh, Warner Media and Discovery are going to merge and form an independent company outside of AT&T. Uh, but another shoe in that consolidation trend has dropped. The information sources say Amazon is in talks to acquire MGM, the movie studio, uh, movie and TV studio, MGM. Variety reports the deal could be worth about $9 billion. And Variety sources said back in December that MGM was looking for a buyer. And senior VP of Amazon Studios Mike Hopkins is reportedly negotiating directly with MGM board chairman Kevin Ulrich on the deal. Uh, MGM is an independent company. It stands alone. So... Right now, everybody who is smaller and stands alone is looking to team up with someone else. Discovery with Warner Media, CBS and Viacom teaming up, and it looks like Amazon might be running a movie studio soon. Well, MGM has, you know, indicated it would like to be bought. <laughs> back back in December, we knew, you know, this probably was going to be a deal with with some entity. Amazon buying MGM. Obviously, MGM has some pretty attractive movie franchises, uh, a lot of you know television programming. I guess I'd, it also makes Amazon Prime or some version of Amazon Prime that would be bundled into an MGM offering like this. Should this deal pan out, could you know could be another revenue stream for Amazon? But 
you know, it's, it, it seems inevitable, right? That Amazon is going to buy a studio, whether it's MGM or another or both. Yeah. I mean, Amazon, Amazon has Amazon studios, <clears throat> which, you know, we, you know, Nimble Collective, we sold out to Amazon. They, they use uh, some of the software that we wrote for some of their animation and special effects. So they have Amazon Studios already, which um, is, is producing a lot of television shows. So it makes sense they're in the market for kind of a larger um, professional studio. MGM has been like shopping itself around, though, I think for like a decade. It's been a while. And so it's interesting that they they, they held out until the streaming world and now they're, now they're grabbed into by Amazon. Yeah, it it makes and I was reading uh I think it was Ampere analysis about how legacy media can win by mining the programming they either already have or can make based on the IP they own. Yeah. But you have to have the ability to make your streaming service the way that Peacock is for NBC for for example. MGM yeah. has tried that. They've tried that with Stargate, they've tried that with a couple other properties uh and I don't think it has gone so well for them. So I think they see that partnering up with somebody, whether it's somebody as big as Amazon or somebody else, is the way to go. Amazon apparently is is the one willing to to shell out the nine billion dollars. So yeah, they go. never had a distribution channel before. So yeah, yeah. There is a disturbing story here, of course, about all the consolidation of of content providers until you're actually anything that you're watching is only coming from about five or six different places. Everybody's complaining about having too many streaming services. Well, pretty soon you won't. It'll all come from, from, from three companies. <laughs> yeah, just like the old days. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Apple's Phil Schiller testified in the Epic versus Apple case on Monday, explaining why Apple keeps streaming services like Stadia out of the App Store. Schiller says it's because for each game offered through the App Store, Apple wants to provide an age rating, parental controls, a product page, privacy policies, stuff like that. Schiller says that games are different than Netflix because Netflix has one sign-in and one privacy policy that covers all of its video content. But with games, even after signing into Stadia, players often sign into individual games to track progress, play with friends. Schiller said, it's something that requires you to do much more than just play video. Hmm. Schiller added, quote, the app store is not a movie store. It isn't about movies. It's an apps and games store. So when you bring in games in a different way, that no longer works as designed in the game store. It's a very Apple response, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, to be like, look, we designed it this way. This is the way it works. I actually get the logic behind what Chiller is saying. I'm not sure if I was running it, I would apply it exactly that way. I think you need to create a new category for things like Luna and Stadia and Project X Cloud. Uh, but if you're not going to adapt to that reality somehow, and you're like, nope, this is the way it's set up, then I guess that makes a sort of sense. Well, it's a good way to lose control of your ecosystem, right? <clears throat> if you if you put your stake in the ground there, uh, you know, the reality is they're just trying to keep their thirty <laughs> percent. That's what this is all this is all coming from. You now. know, it, I I don't think you're wrong, but I don't think that's all. I, I think because because it's Apple, I think there's also like, well, sure, we want to keep our thirty percent, but also these are the rules we created, right? And we yeah. follow our our rules. They're they're well, kind of dogmatic that way. Yeah, they're falling back on that. But think of the children, like like mm -hmm. you know that they that they always have in the past, and it. What's going to wind up happening is what Epic is doing. And it, and it took a company like Epic to kind of bring this to the face of Apple and the face of Google. Um, Google had an interesting response. Like I, They look like they are, and I'm not sure if they're connected or not. I'm sure that they are. But they're dropping um, their App Store um, royalty fee to 15% for the first mm -hmm. million dollars earned. Uh, and that, that came out around the same time Epic started making a lot of noise about this. So. Yeah, I'm very curious what the fate of the Google Epic court case will be. Yeah. Uh, I would not be shocked to see that settled out yeah. of court uh, after the Apple Apple Epic case is Agreed. is kind of known. Uh, we're going to see appeals of the Apple Epic case, but but once they know, like, okay, here's the here's the parameters in which we can play on an appeal, mm -hmm. uh, I think then they'll be able to go to Google and say, all right, fine, let's let's figure this out. Yeah. Well, folks, uh, sometimes you don't have uh, all the time in the world. That's why we provide just the headlines. Check out our related show, Daily Tech Headlines, all the essential tech news in about five minutes at dailytechheadlines.com.
Google I.O. kicked off with an in-person live stream. They didn't have developers attending yet, but they did have uh, Google employees in attendance, socially distanced, while the actual Google executives, including Sundar Pichai, came out and spoke on a live stream, not a pre-produced uh, announcement. The main thing that came out of Google I.O., as everyone expected, was Android 12. And the main thing about Android 12 is it's very pastel and bubbly now, thanks to <laughs> the new Material U design. Uh, it offers customization. You can choose your color palette now. Uh, it does neat things like adapt to your widgets, so they slide around and, and the color adapts. Uh, you can have it reset your color palette to match a background photo so that everything looks nice uh, when it's over the background. There's nifty dynamic lighting on the lock screen that kind of follows your finger. It can adapt in other ways, too. The clock gets bigger if there are no notifications, for instance. On the more mundane side, uh, Google Pay, Home, Mic and camera settings are all in quick controls now. So you can go up in quick mm -hmm. control, turn off your mic, turn off your video for everything. Privacy dashboard now gives you more info on what data is being captured by which apps uh, and things like now playing and smart reply run inside the private compute core so that AI is walled off from the rest of the OS and audio and language processing happens on device, nothing going in the cloud. Finally, uh, there's an Android TV remote built into the operating system now. I know Android TV fans are, are very excited about that. And Android Auto now supports more wireless connections to phones and digital car key support. So you can use your phone like a key more easily. Android 12 beta is available right now if you can run it on a Pixel, a OnePlus, or a Xiaomi phone. Rob, how are you feeling about Android 12? Uh, it looks kind of cool. I mean, it, it's it's almost a reorganization release more than anything else. Android 11 had a lot more uh, tech involved in it that, that elevated it higher. Uh, 12 seems to be, you know, finally a realization of the material design stuff they've been preaching for the last five or six years. So that, that's really great to see. It's very pretty. Uh, I like that. I like the, uh, you, you, you almost could tell, you could almost bet money that once they released Chromecast or what do they call it? Google TV with Chromecast. Google TV, yeah. Yeah, that the next thing was going to be to incorporate it into the OS on the phone, which is what they did. So that's that's very fun to see. Um, the the keyless entry to cars, though, that requires a lot of partnerships. I think they've just got BMW is the only one that's holding to that right now. They showed a bunch of logos, but they only said BMW by name. So I think okay. there may be more in the works or they were combining the wireless Android Auto with the key thing to be like, we've got partnerships with companies. Uh, but yeah, so far, so far you're right. Just BMW. Yeah, it's nice. I, it, you know, advancements like this are always welcome. So, I mean, and the it, pastel thing is true. Uh, you mentioned pastel. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I don't know, Easter colors, whatever. But that aside, <laughs> just the customization it looks really nice. Mm -hmm. And I know some people are like, eh, what do I care if, you know, my widgets are yellow rather than lime green or something. And some people don't, but I mean, it, there's just, it's just one more level of not just customization on the user's part, but a unification so that everything just looks a little bit less of an app mess, which we right. are used to on lots of different mobile OSs. So yeah, I mean, I, I was really impressed. I, I'm glad they didn't, um, jettison widgets. I, I was a little concerned as we kept advancing through the OS releases that widgets were getting devalued. Uh, I, I still use them a lot. I love having them on the, on, the, on the phone. And so it's nice to see that they've been incorporated in this design, pastel or no pastel. But. Yeah. And, and, and uh, works with any app. That's the yeah, any developer can can work with this now too. So it's mm -hmm. you're not going to have that jarring situation. Well, you don't have to have that jarring situation where your your app design is like, yeah, we 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 don't adapt uh, to your color palette. Sorry, they, you can do that. You can have them, have them blend right on in. Yeah. Probably the biggest news, quote unquote, news of I/O is that Samsung and Google have unified Wear OS and Tizen. Uh, it looks to me from the outside here that most of the Tizen unification here is under the hood, uh, and it still looks like Wear OS, and it's still called Wear OS. Mm -hmm. uh, but it does mean that Google Play is coming to the Samsung Galaxy Watch. Uh, the next versions will be Wear OS-powered watches, uh, and Samsung welcomed developers, uh, encouraged its Tizen developers to develop on Google Play. Uh, also, fitness features from Fitbit coming to Wear OS. I don't think that's a big shocker. And uh, Fitbit devices in the future will run Wear mm -hmm. OS. Uh, so trying to bring some of the best of that Fitbit fitness area into Wear OS makes sense too. Yeah, the I, it is a little bit of a shocker because it, it took 
Google as, as a company, when they buy another larger entity that has a competing product, it does take them a while. I mean, mm -hmm. I, Waze and Google uh, Maps, for instance, it, we're, they're just now starting to like touch code bases together and you can see features from one bleeding over to the other. So for uh, the, Fitbit IO, uh, the Fitbit OS to get incorporated into Wear OS, I think is kind of a big deal. And well, to, to be fair, uh, I, I believe Park, the co-founder of Fitbit said, we're bringing features over, not we've brought features over. Yeah, so we'll see. We'll see how fast. Fair, fair enough. Yeah, that's that's fair enough. The the Tizen thing is surprising, because that that was Samsung going, yeah, no, we're 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 going to go do our own thing. We don't really care about Wear OS, and I this is them throwing in the towel. I'm thinking, that's what it sounds like. Yeah, um, uh, you know, I think the idea was on a watch. The app ecosystem may not be as determinative as long as you've got some of the majors uh, because people don't, uh, you know, install apps as widely uh, mm -hmm. on a watch. But uh, I think they really, the the tone that I got from this announcement is that Samsung really wants more developers working on its watch yeah. basis. And this was the way to do it. It is interesting to see Google allow it to be a collaboration, allow it to be, we're teaming right. up, not just like, yeah, Samsung, if you want to switch to Wear OS, great. Otherwise, forget it. Like they, yeah. Google moved a little towards Samsung on this. Yeah, somebody who has a Fitbit smartwatch, I have the Versa 2, and I'm very invested in the Fitbit ecosystem. I pay for Fitbit Premium, the whole mm -hmm. thing. Uh, you know, <laughs> because of that, I, you know, I look the other way on how lacking my Versa 2 is in a lot of other things. To be able to have uh, any number of Wear OS devices that can handle all of the Fitbit stats and data that I'm already uh, that I already care about, but also just be a better smart smartwatch in general. Mm -hmm. Super attractive to the Fitbit folks. Are are you, uh, Sarah? I forgot. Are you uh, iPhone ecosystem? I am. So yeah, <laughs> which is why why the Fitbit Versa Two is right. It's only so useful. Yeah. It's only so useful, but uh, but no, I I I'm I'm excited about this. Cool, very cool. Uh, Google was also showing a lot of its engineering prowess off, uh, announcing uh, new tensor processing units, the TPU V4 uh, for AI uses, a new quantum AI campus to develop stable qubits for quantum computing. Uh, they they even did the let's have a celebrity join us uh, and Michael Pena uh, was there because he's in Ant Man I guess which involves quantum stuff anyway uh, it, it was kind of fun I guess uh, they also talked about Lambda uh, L A M D A an open domain language model that learns concepts from training data for more conversational natural responses a little more context awareness uh, showed a discussion with Pluto the planet uh, as an example of how Lambda is implemented where where Pluto can kind of know what you mean rather than being very literal about what you're saying. Also had a conversation with a paper airplane, which is a, was a, a little more uh, metaphysical, uh, but still showed off <laughs> Lambda skills uh, and showed off Project Starline, which is a big concept thing. It actually reminded me of, of when Cisco was doing those big installations for video conferencing, except this is 3D and uses holography. Uh, Cameras and depth sensors make a high-res holographic capture of you in real time. This is streaming video, compresses it a hundred times, sends it over the internet, and at the other end, a light field display is used to create the hologram of who you are talking to. Uh, this is meant right now for health enterprise, maybe some media uses, uh, very enterprise level stuff. Uh, but certainly in the video, looked impressive, and they had a lot of people that they had brought in to try it who were, were raving about it. Uh, but this is this is that kind of thing where Google has moved out of being like, right. here's the next consumer product to here's the research we're doing and what it can do. Yeah, it's, a, it's also a good way to rescue Princess Leia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when they get it smaller and can put it in a droid, it's gonna be yeah. amazing. Uh, yeah. But I, I mean, I, I definitely wanna go try uh, this at some point to see just how, how well it works. But the idea is that you can actually make eye contact it will adapt to your position so that it looks like a person is sitting there and it doesn't like kind of flicker out when you move around to the side. Uh, and and the Lambda stuff, a little, little more whimsical with the demonstrations, but again, showing off, uh, you know, the prowess they have with DeepMind and, and AI and, and everything else. Yeah, I think both are really, really impressive. I mean, the, the uh, machine learning stuff in Lambda, I'm fascinated with. Back when I was in ad tech, you know, we would work with, with, um, lexical 
translations and and having uh, uh, you know these 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 trees that would remember phrases. But this is this is light years beyond that. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Yeah, being able to I mean, tell what you mean that's a big deal. Folksonomies and taxonomies, and yeah, this is this is one level beyond all of that. So. One of the things I, I was getting a little hung up with Project Starline was okay, I understand the lifelike 3D quality of it, but how many situations, and I'm sure some are obvious, but how many situations would that be so much more useful than someone on a nice big monitor in a video? We're struggling. So <clears throat> we're in this situation now where we all went home for a year, right? Because we all got the flu, yeah. we all went home. Uh, and now we're uh, planning our course back to the various offices. And we have 11 offices there firm-wide. And we're struggling right now with each of those offices understanding how a hybrid environment would work. Um, <clears throat> and you know, Zoom calls and Skype calls and all that stuff are great when everyone has a laptop in front of them or you know set up a rig like this where it's just you know there's sarah there's tom there's rob and you're all on the screen and talking but the second that breaks into half of you are in a conference room and there's a camera in the corner of the conference room and maybe there's a mic on the table or maybe there's you know it, you're in this like weird audio vacuum and, and video vacuum it does change the dynamics of the meeting very very quickly uh, and so if you had a situation where you could holographically project somebody into a conference room, regardless of where they were, I think it would make a difference. Yeah, as, as, as yeah. long as it was playing like, field being leveled somehow. Yeah, somehow, somehow reduces right some of those Zoom fatigue factors uh, that are caused by the fact that you're not really there, and you're you feel like you have to pay more attention, right? If yeah. if everybody feels like they're actually there, then you go back to like, all right, I don't have to constantly be looking uh, at somebody. But this is this is also not ready for your house yet. No. Uh, which is why I think they mentioned media and health, right. because health, I can go do some some virtual like I could consult a specialist who's halfway around the world and he'd be able to see, you know, she'd be able to see me in 3D, which which helps the diagnostic process. Obviously, media, you know, you can bring mm -hmm. in a guest and it looks like they're sitting there on the set with you, that kind of stuff. On the consumer product front, Search is testing a multitask unified model or MUM that can be more context sensitive. Uh, like you could show it a picture of your boots and say, hey, are these good to hike Mount Fuji? This is, it's again, more of that contextual understanding. It would know how to answer and even be able to translate some Japanese resources for you. So this is something that will come to some queries in Search at some point. They're testing it right now. Google Maps is getting some more practical things for your everyday use, virtual street signs, key landmarks, indoor augmented reality directions. In fact, indoor train station directions are rolling out to Zurich this week, Tokyo next month. Google Shop is incorporating Google Lens, so you can find a product by picture, mm -hmm. take a picture of a, of a chair and, and be able to search for it easily that way, even a screenshot. Any merchant can now list on Google Shop for free. They're partnering with Shopify to bring in 1.7 million merchants. Google Photos added a lot of controls from looking for innovative patterns uh, to create new memory collections to giving you the ability to hide people or time periods from your memories uh, if you don't want them there. And you can lock a folder in photos to keep it out of shared albums. Finally, a dermatology assistance tool is coming to search for you to find more than 288 skin conditions uh, and answer 90% of the most common searches. So how did that work? You take a photo of your... You just describe Rash. it, but yes, you could also take a photo that you take a photo at from three different angles, uh, and it will be able to give you a better result based on that. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, I end up on realself.com, and it always leads to cancer. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. You have cancer.com? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I love the idea. The Mount Fuji example with the hiking boots is a great one because it's like really just changing the nature of, okay, what? how many query options do I have? How do I want to approach this question? Because right now I might say, what's the best hiking boot for you know, treacherous terrain like Mount Fuji or something like that. And then you start, you get into a rabbit hole and you're on brand websites and you're buying shoes and you know, it's, it, it can get out of control quickly, but if you have something a lot more specific, this is a great way to, to keep that, that query, uh, a lot more focused. Well, it's also, I mean, this technology plus Lambda, um, which is why I'm actually more interested about Lambda than in what the, the holographic research. It, it, it's providing an interface into not just a computer, but a larger computer 
uh, enterprise, a, a larger organization, uh, that's more conversational. Uh, you, would, you would interact with Google as a search engine the way you would interact with any of us as a, as a search engine or a resource. You know, and, and it's like, yeah, do these, are these boots good for my hike up Mount Fuji? And what else should I wear? And what are the restaurants nearby? You can have a you can have a conversation as opposed to understanding how you have to structure your search. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Google Foo goes away, and, and you know, yeah. like you you shouldn't need to be good at search. You should just be able to ask your question. Right. That's right. Uh, a few other notable announcements. Obviously, uh, Google really emphasizing uh, security by default, privacy by design, uh, over and over again. Uh, Smart Canvas for improved project management coming to Workspace. Uh, customizations coming to Google Meet for everyone, not just workspace users. Duplex type technology incorporated to help you change your password. Uh, if, if it notes uh, you know, that your password has been in a breach, it'll guide you over to changing your password in the Google <clears throat> Password Manager. Can also import uh, from other password managers if you wanna easily move in, uh, bring your passwords easily across devices. There's some easier ways to delete the last thing you searched for. If you're like, I don't want this showing up in my customizations, you can you can now just immediately delete that search uh, and also delete your history now from the top level of settings, a little faster to get to. And they're improving computational photography algorithms to take better pictures of people in color, people of color rather, uh, so that, that you don't have the darker pictures for darker skin tones. Uh, and they talked a lot about sustainability uh, and trying uh, to reach a goal of being 24-7 carbon-free in all their data centers and offices by 2030. That's wonderful. Yeah. That, that, that last one is, is, is important for everybody. The 2030 um, initiative is a big deal at SOM <clears throat> right now, obviously, uh, it, as it is everywhere. So it's great to see Google hop on board with that. All right, there you go, folks. Google I.O., let us know what you thought. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Well, if you're an engineering student, you might want to listen to this one. The WLKATA, or WLKATA, Mini Robot 6-Access Mini Robot Arm is a professional-grade tool designed for engineering students. In fact, it's specifically for engineering students, mimicking robotic arms that are found in ultra-precise factory scenarios. The arm uses an Arduino control board. It's also open source, and it's only 9 inches high and 0.2 millimeters repeated position accuracy to let engineers and manufacturers Manufacturers simulate real-world robotic uses in a test setting right from a desktop. Attachments for the arm include a micro servo, servo gripper, a pen holder, a suction cup, pneumatic two-finger gripper, universal ball gripper, GoPro carrier, even a Bluetooth remote controller. Students can get the WL Kata Microbot 6 Ad Access Mini Robot Arm Professional Kit. Also, there's an educational kit for just over $1,500 and $1,300 respectively. I mean, if you grew up with Lego Mindstorm, oh. <laughs> that's totally what this is. This is, you're an engineer who grew up making Lego robots. Now you can make real robots yeah. with this. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that price point's amazing. Uh, the, the, most, uh, the cheapest professional one, I believe, is an order of magnitude more expensive than this. Oh, yeah. yeah so that's kind of neat. It'd be, it'd be fun to see the mods that come out within weeks of this thing. Oh, getting sure. Released. Yeah. 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 No doubt. Yeah. Yeah, you get yourself a Mirobot six access mini robot arm. Do yeah. send us emails on everything that you've built and created. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Uh, if you have questions or comments, you can always send all that stuff there too. Thank you in advance. Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Eric Holm, Carmine Bailey, and Matthew Stevens. Also, we have a brand new boss, and his name is John Ra, who just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, John. Also, thanks to Rob DeMillo for being with us today. Rob, where can people keep up with everything that you do? Oh, my Lord. Well, you can go to uh, about me slash Rob DeMillo to find out all those locations. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Uber Rob. And uh, that's about it. I pulled myself off Facebook, so we'll go from there. Well, congratulations, I guess. <laughs> 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 That's something I consider doing often as well. We are live on this show Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We are back at it tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. I hope you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>